So I'm very happy to have Miriam Benisti with us today. Uh, Miriam is uh, thankfully not in too different a time zone coming from Santiago. <laughs> um, she did her undergraduate degree in Paris and her PhD from Grenoble, um, where she became an expert, an early expert, I would say, in infrared interferometry uh, with a VLT. Um, after some postdocs in Archetri and uh, the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg, um, she joined the staff back at IPAG in Grenoble. Um, and for the past, I guess, three and a half years, um, she's been on a, a long-term visitor program, a joint program in uh, Chile at the Universidad de Chile um, in Santiago. Um, so Miriam's an expert, as I said, on, on infrared interferometry, but just generally high resolution imaging, particularly of protoplanetary disks. Um, and she uh, has done some really important work, not only in infrared interferometry and now with millimeter interferometry with ALMA, um, but especially with high resolution non-interferometric imaging <laughs> in the infrared, which I think she'll talk a lot about today um, using the, the VLT. Um, so again, very happy to have you, uh, Miriam, and uh, please take it away. Thank, thank you, Sean. So I'll share my screen. Can you see the slides? Yep. Great. So, um, well, first, thank you very much for hosting me. It's a really great pleasure, a great honor to, to be able to give to present my results and those of my collaborators. And um, as I said earlier, I'm very frustrated that I could not uh, uh, visit you. So I hope I get another invitation as soon as someone, as soon as we all get the vaccination. Um, so I'm going to present observation of planetary disks uh, obtained at high resolution. And in most of the images that you're going to see uh, are tracing the dust component, which is not uh, the major component of protoplanetary disk but it still allows to uh, infer some interesting uh, processes. So the outline of my talk that I first uh, give a bit of context and the motivation of why we want to observe these disks and um, explain very briefly uh, how we get uh, this kind of observations in the infrared. And then I'll go to uh, present a few examples, very few examples, because now there are many, the, five, uh, the, last, uh, the past five years have been really, really, uh, producing a lot of images. So um, showing a few examples of substructures that we see in disks. Then I will show a exa few examples again of how we can have a very strong synergy and we're using uh, another wavelength, a complementary wavelength. And finally, discuss um, observation of uh, what we have so far uh, in terms of embedded protoplanets in disks. <clears throat> So the main motivation is uh, really summarized in this plot, but this plot is only two dimensions. So it's really difficult to explain uh, really um, the, the, the whole um, question, the entire set of questions that we have in mind. So the goal is really to understand the diversity in exoplanetary systems. Uh, we see in this plot, uh, the mass versus the separation. And we know that we have about more than 4,000 exoplanets uh, found today. Both, um, we have um, giant planets that are orbiting very far from the star. And at the same time, we also have, we also have a very compact uh, multi-planetary system um, that are, for example, in this case, located within uh, one astronomical unit. So he, this is one astrono astronomical unit. And you see that we have uh, a bunch of um, planets, one third of gas giants, about one third of Neptune-like planets, and one third are about uh, super Earth's planets. Um, we, have, we also have a diversity in not only in the architecture of the planetary system, but also in the nature of the planets themselves and um, in their uh, orbital parameters. So the question that we want to ask is, where, um, where is this diversity um, ba basically being initiated? Is it in the early stages of the planet formation in disk? And what are the, the mechanisms that will set this diversity? And um, this is, of course, something that you all know, uh, just to say that planets and are a natural outcome of uh, stellar formation. Um, and this starts with the gravitational collapse of a molecular cloud. And uh, due to con conservation of angular momentum, material is uh, distributed along the, the equatorial plane in the protoplanetary disk. So this disk has been called circumstellar disk and then protoplanetary disks and uh, recently planet forming disk. 
But actually, we don't really know if planets are forming at this stage, which is about a few million years, or at this stage. And then we end up with a planetary system. And most of the, actually, all of these more than 4,000 exoplanets that have been found until now have been found in major systems that have already dissipated their birth environments uh, the protoplanetary disk, except in one case that I will present at the end of the, of the talk. So actually, we don't really know um, how, do we, how do we get from there to there. And that's really the motivation, I think, in um, everyone working on disks uh, right now, uh, to understand how these uh, planets form, where do they form, and at which stage of um, the whole evolution do they form. And once you form a planet, for example, a giant planet, how do they interact with their disk and how do they influence the subsequent formation of lower mass planets? And if you think of our own solar system, the role of Jupiter has been uh, dramatic in setting the dynamical evolution of, and also the, 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 the possibility to have lower mass planets. And we know that disks evolve also naturally uh, through multiple processes, multiple mechanisms, and uh, they evolve at the same time as planets are forming. So really, disk evolution and planet formation happen at the same time, and they influence each other. And how do they influence each other and impact the outcome of planetary systems is not uh, clear yet. So to try to ad address this, we need to understand uh, the early stages of planet formation and look at the structure and the evolution of disks at the time where planets are forming. And to do that, we want to look at uh, disks, but also at forming planets, baby planets. And how can we do that? We observe these disks, and we know that disks dissipate in a few million years. Uh, this is a, the infrared excess, which traces the, the presence of a disk against the age for different regions of the sky. And we can actually use that to look at different regions of the sky that have different ages, so different stage of evolution to see how, for example, planet formation can affect uh, the disks. And we can also look in observations, in images, for we can search for tracers, for imprint, for signatures of planet disk interactions. And we know that once a planet is embedded in a disk, this is a hydro simulation by uh, Jehan Bey, the planet, a massive planet, will carve a gap and also launch uh, spirals. So you can think that you want to look for the spirals, you want to look for these uh, regions that are depleted in material due to the planet. You can also look in the spectral energy distribution or in, in uh, uh, spectra. For example, here you have the, the black body emission uh, from the star. And then the gray line is the excess that you would get from a full disk. And once you have a, 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 a cavity or a gap due to a planet, you have a decrease a lack of infrared excess. So you can actually also see that in the photometry. But so you look for gap, you look for spiral, but you can also look for uh, this kind of feature, rings. And this is actually something that we expect. This is the grain size versus the separation from the star. And once we have a planet that is carving a gap in the disk, we, we expect the large grains uh, to actually concentrate at the pressure maximum here. And when you look, when you produce a synthetic observation from this kind of simulation, what you get is actually something that, um, a ring that is uh, located at this separation, something like this. So you want to look for rings, you want to look for planet, for, for sorry, uh, gaps, for spirals, and of course for planets. And how do we do that? Uh, well, there are many ways uh, to search for this feature. Uh, if you look in the infrared, if you look in, at the thermal emission, then you actually are looking at everything that is located within one AU, so dust that is really, really hot, dust at the dust remation edge. And to do that at one AU, at the typical distance of star forming region, is, uh, needs a resolution of, say, a few milli arc seconds. So to do that, you need to use infrared interferometry with VLTI. So I will not cover uh, this in this talk. I'll just show at the end of the talk one, um, of one type of observation with VLTI. Then if you look with uh, regular telescopes, so not doing interferometry uh, in the infrared, you're sensitive to uh, the scattered light. So the light from the star that is scattered off by those grains located at the surface of the disk in a very, very tenuous layer. So it doesn't probe the mass, the amount of mass of the disk, but it, it is very sensitive to the shape of the surface. So to the basically the, the, the vertical structure of the disk. Now, if you look in the submillimeter, you're sensitive to uh, colder regions, so closer to the mid-plane, so closer to where the bulk of the mass of the disk is. And also you're sensitive to grains, dust grains that are um, 
larger, so one millimeter, a few millimeters pebbles or a few hundred of microns uh, size pebbles. So what is really powerful is to combine multi-wavelength observation, of course, also at the gas, um, and I will, but I will not uh, cover it uh, so much in this talk. Um, when you look at uh, the same disk with multiple wavelengths, you are tracing different regions of the disk, so the surface and the midplane, but you're also tracing different processes, different dynamical processes affecting different grain sizes, so the large grains and the small grains. So that's uh, the aim of multi-wavelength observation is to use these dust grains as tracers of the physical processes. Now, if you look in the infrared, you have a very um, difficult problem is that the star is really bright and the disk is really faint compared to the star. So what you need to do is to mask the star to be able to see uh, something that is uh, really faint, that is the disk. And this is even more an issue when you look for planets because planets are even fainter and actually are outshined by the disk. So that's the principle of coronagraphic uh, observation. And this has been done uh, since many years, uh, for example, with uh, the HST. And there are very early observation of uh, the Hubble Space Telescope that show beautiful uh, images of the scattered light uh, uh, signal from a disk, so something that is really, really extended. And that comes from the surface uh, of the disk. And one thing that we have to keep in mind is that the the scattered light is really sensitive to the stellar radiation because this is uh, just uh, scattering off uh, on the surface. So the further you are, the less irradiation from the star you get as it goes as r to the minus two. So at some point it just gets uh, faint because you cannot detect anymore the, the scattered light, but you still have dust grains there. And the scattered light is partly polarized. And this is really good because we can use this as an advantage as something that will allow us to see better the disk. And why is that? It's because the stellar light is uh, mostly unpolarized, while the scattered light, so the light from the stars scattered off the dust grains, is linearly polarized. So basically what you want to do is to subtract two images obtained uh, with polarized light with two different orientations of the polarization. And when you do that, when you subtract these two images, you actually cancel completely the stellar light. And you are only left with the, the disk light. Of course, it's not that simple, so what we do in in, in general from the ground is that we use both this technique that we call the polarization differential imaging and a coronagraphic mask to, to mask the star. But one thing that we have to keep in mind when we look at scattered light and polarized uh, images is that um, what you see is not exactly what is there. And why is that is because both polarization and scattering have efficiency that depend on the angular distribution of the signal. So, uh, depend on uh, basically the, the history of the photon. So if you're the observer here and you're looking at the disk here, when this, the photon goes this way, is scattered towards you, but that's what we call the forward scattering. On that side, the photon has to go this way and then backward, back, backward towards you. That's backward scattering. Along the, semi, along the minor axis, the photon goes uh, through 90 degree scattering angle. And Here's a plot that shows a degree of polarization against uh, the azimuthal angle. And you can see that against this, the scattering angle, sorry, that the polarization efficiency is maximum for 90 degree scattering angles. And that means that if you look at the disk along the minor axis, you would get uh, over brightness on both sides due to only the scattering efficiency, the polarization efficiency. And then the scattering efficiency depends on the, what we call the phase, the phase function, depends on the grain size, the grain composition, the porosity. And for large grains, uh, we have much more forward scattering than for small grains. Small grains uh, scatter almost isotropically. So we have uh, a disk that will, with small grains that will look um, equally bright. Whereas with large grain, we would see um, along this, for example, um, side, uh, one disk that is much brighter than on the other side where you have backward scattering. And there are also finally uh, projection effects. Um, the disk is not something that is flat, it's something that is flare, it, has, it looks like a ball. So of course, if for example, you just think about uh, a circle here and you incline and uh, have a ball shape, then your ellipse will be off-centered with respect to center of the star. So that means that things do not look exactly uh, like you first um, believe. So after this introduction, I'm going to show now some example of uh, substructures that we see uh, in some images. 
And first, I want to say that although I have been working um, only with observation from the ground, uh, there has been beautiful images obtained with HST uh, on, uh, on bright objects that already showed that these objects were very highly structured. And you can see here that there is a gigantic nebulosity here, uh, spirals, and here, for example, rings, and also a darker region uh, that, we, call, that we, we think is a gap. Um, and we also see azimuthal brightness distribution. So uh, these were the very first evidence that the disks do not look as smooth as in the sketch that I showed before, but the disks are highly structured. And these are all ground-based uh, images and uh, all obtained on the same disk, which is an intermediate uh, mass young star. And um, this is the first polarized uh, observation of this star, of this disk, then that's uh, one that was observed uh, with a macro instrument at the VLT. And then the instruments got better and better. Uh, and now we have a very powerful instrument uh, sphere at the VLT. And the main difference is that there has been a huge um, step in instrumentation, and in particular in the use of adaptive objects that correct for the atmospheric uh, perturbation. And uh, sphere is equipped with an extreme adaptive optic system, very efficient. So we are, uh, for some of the, the disks that we have, we are very close to the diffraction limit. And you can see that in this disk, for example, we see a bunch of substructures. So we have three gaps and two rings and a ring that is asymmetric. Uh, and this is really uh, thanks to the, 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 power, the powerful instrumentation. So um, this is just um, not the total sample because now we have uh, much more, but say this is, uh, these are, the sample of this that we observed is through um, the guaranteed time observation program uh, with Sphere. Um, so we have young stars that are uh, going from um, 0 0.7 solar mass to 2.5 or 3 solar mass, solar masses. Um, and you can see here, so the mass against the age of the system, knowing that the age are really not well, in general, not well estimated. Um, and for the Herbig stars, we observed really um, the bright disk we observe a bunch of features. So for example, a sample of rings and gap. Here you can see that the disc, you can really see the, 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 the ball shape of the disc with the, the bottom side of the disc as well. Um, here we can see two beautiful spirals and um, here as well, two spirals with two uh, dark regions. So in general, as soon as the disc is very bright in the infrared, we get beautiful features. This is also the case for intermediate mass titori stars or titori stars that are actually circumbinary disks uh, where we always have um, basically enough infrared signal to um, see substructures. This disk is uh, almost edge on. And here you can see that, for example, there is a very large uh, spiral connecting to another object. But we also have a lot of very faint objects um, which are actually the youngest objects. And when we observe this uh, category of objects, we see that we, I mean, most of them are actually non-detections or very, um, very, very uh, faint disks or very compact disks in scattered light. And that is actually very interesting because this tells us a lot about the, the general structure of the disk. If the disk is, doesn't show up in scattered light, it means that it's actually not able to reflect the light from the star and that is actually quite flat. And this tells us a lot about uh, the evolution itself uh, of the disk. And these are disks that so far have not been uh, analyzed and um, modeled. So most of the, the, the disks that, I mean, all of the images that I'm going to show from now are actually these very bright and very extended uh, features. And let's start with uh, disks that uh, show multiple rings. So we, as I said in the introduction, we know that rings and gaps are natural outcome of finite disk interactions. So we see multiple rings in scatterlight in many objects. This is what really dominates. Um, and this is um, the same conclusion as in the some millimeter surveys. And um, what you really want to, to do is to put basically a planet every time you have a gap. So if this, all of these gaps are tracing planets and we are, um, we are seeing multiple planetary systems information. And when you have a disk like this one that has multiple rings, so here you only, say, you only see one arc because it's very faint, so we cannot see the other side. Here, it's, you only see the arc, one arc, uh, because we are using a post-processing technique that is actually canceling the other side. 
But this disk has actually five uh, rings. And what you can see is that these ellipses are all offset with respect to the center of the, the image. And that offset is actually tracing uh, the ball shape that I was telling you about. So when you have uh, disk images that show multiple rings, you are able to reconstruct basically the, the shape of the surface. Um, you can also do that with uh, CO, for example, in the submillimeter and compare the different uh, surface heights of the different layers. And so we did that on a bunch of uh, objects and uh, basically we um, retrieving uh, the Z of the, R, of the R. So I just want to stress that uh, the scattering height is not the pressure scale height. Um, it's probably like three or four times uh, larger. We have disks that show um, spiral arms. Uh, this is not as common as, as, as uh, rings. Uh, if you can see here, for example, this disk has a dust depleted cavity. So that we thought that we think is due to a massive planet, uh, then a ring and then two spirals. So, uh, and here they have, we can see three different lanes that I will discuss in a minute. And in that case, in these two cases, actually, we also have spirals and we have multiple spirals, much more than this. Here are two and here are two. But these cases are actually um, multiple systems. So here there, there is a binary, circum binary disk. And this one is actually uh, a multiple system. There are four objects. And you can see that this, uh, we have multiple spirals here, uh, filaments, streamers, and also uh, these dark regions here. And these dark regions here are what we call in here, where we, where we interpret as being shadows, meaning that there is some material very close to the star that is actually shielding the stellar irradiation. And there are regions of the disk that do not, that do not receive any more irradiation. And these shadows are actually uh, often associated with spirals and with a very large near infrared excess, uh, which indicates that the inner regions that we cannot access because we have this coronographic mask are highly perturbed. If you want to have a high near infrared excess, you need to actually have uh, dust grains lifted up very high so you can actually uh, irradiate, um, so the star can irradiate uh, on a large surface. So these disks have a lot of evidence that they are highly perturbed. Now, what is the origin of the spiral arms? Um, so I mentioned the possibility of uh, planets, uh, but there's another possibility is that these spirals are tracing, tracing gravitational instability in the disk. So if the disk is very massive, it will um, um, induce gravitational instability. Uh, however, we think that most of our disks are not that massive to allow gravitational instability to occur. And disk masses is really difficult, are really difficult to, to obtain. Um, so there's still uh, some possibility here. Uh, now planets. So we know that we have in most of these disks, these cavities. So we want to put the planet in the cavity to create the cavity and the spiral. And this is a hydrodynamical simulation um, that shows these uh, beautiful spirals. But the problem is that these spirals that we see in these uh, simulations are actually very close, very, um, they have an opening angle that is very, very small. And the opening angle depends on the temperature in the disk. So basically, if you want to have uh, something that is spiral that are very open, you need to have a very, very hot disk, much hotter than what is realistic to assume. So a solution would be to have a planet that is actually outside of the disk and that these spirals are actually the inner spirals like these ones. And they have a much uh, larger opening angle. But there are two issues there is that first, you would still need to have a planet inside the cavity to create a cavity. So you, you would need two planets. And then that this planet that is uh, usually modeled is a quite massive planet that should have been detected. And I come back to this at the end of the talk. So we still do not really know. Um, now we also so see uh, evidence for, as I was mentioning, uh, shadows. This is an example where we have a disk that has this empty cavity, dust depleted cavity, this ring with this az azimuthal uh, modulation and two spirals. You can see that the, by the opening of the spiral already, the opening angle that this side of the disk is the side that is actually facing you. Uh, so you also see in the opening angle of the spiral, the ball shape of the disk. And we managed to reproduce uh, this observation with a relative transfer model. And this is an azimuthal uh, profile at three different wavelengths where you can see the, the presence of the shadow here and then the overbrightness. And we reproduce the overbrightness and the, the modulation with the azimuth only by using grains that have a very high uh, polarization efficiency along the major, the, the, the major axis. 
and that is only due to the uh, polarization efficiency. Now to reproduce the misalignment, uh, to reproduce the shadow, sorry, we need to infer some misaligned uh, energies. So we consider observations from the VLTI, so the infrared interferometry that allows us to measure the inner disk uh, with mere second resolution, and we obtain an inclination and position angle. Now we do uh, just an ellipse fitting here, and we get inclination and position angle for the outer disk. But if you look at these values, they're not so different, and we cannot, with small misalignments, reproduce these shadows. So what the key here is to assume that the near side of the inner disk is not the near side of the outer disk. So basically you have a really a flip in the rotation between the inner and the outer disk. And this is just a small video that shows, for example, an inner disk that you start to misalign and with small misalignment, you have a very broad shadow. And then as soon as the misalignment, the inclinations is really large, you, you get this uh, very narrow shadow and then you can move around your disk. We also see very broad shadows. I was just mentioning this uh, very narrow lane, but in that case, for example, just half of the disk is in the, sh is in the shade. And to do that, this, again, uh, we need to have a misalignment and something that is more like 30 degrees misalignment. And to reproduce this observation, we used a model that is not appropriate for this object because we used an equal mass binary and we know that this object is not an equal mass binary, but the physics is the same. So basically here we have an equal mass binary that is inclined with respect to the, the, the outer disk by 60 degrees. And there is a ring that is uh, breaking from the outer disk and then that is uh, processing. So we took one of the snapshots of this simulation, one that uh, we liked and that was giving us uh, 30 degrees misalignment. And we post-processed this hydro simulation uh, in with relative transfer and obtained an image that is uh, very similar. So what we infer here is that we have an inner disk that is misaligned by 30 degrees. So you still have direct irradiation of that side of the disk and direct irradiation from just a little part of this disk here through the dust sublimation, um, through the, the inner cavity, dust-free cavity uh, due to the dust sublimation. So here the dust is at 15 K. And then we found shadows that were even broader than 180 degrees. So this one, for example, has this uh, very, very broad shadow and these multiple rings. And broad very, very broad shadows are really tricky to, to reproduce. So we use a relative transfer model with no hydro this time. When you misalign the inner disk, you get this broad shadow that I just showed up to 180 degrees. But we found that basically to reproduce more than 180 degrees, we needed to actually misalign two components so that the shadows will just overlap. And that's uh, our best model. So in this disk, we used two misaligned regions with only very small misalignments. But I should stress here that we used uh, very sharp uh, rings, really like this. And scattered light is very, very sensitive to change in the, in the to geometric changes, basically. So uh, this work should be actually uh, done, should, should, be, should be done now with uh, a proper warp model, for example. And again on shadow, uh, what we found is that when we had multiple epochs of shadows, is that these shadows are of this disk, is that these shadows are actually moving and they are very variable with time. So here you can see that there are multiple epochs where the, the shadows are moving. And here as well, this is a disk that has this dust depleted cavity and shadows that are moving uh, all over the place. And you can see that the time scale of variation is actually very short. It's one day or two days. So basically we have something that is shielding the star that is, um, uh, basically preventing the outer disk from being irradiated. And that changes on time scales that are extremely fast. This means that it can only be almost on the star. It's very, very close to the star. It still has to be dust uh, to produce this um, shadow. So we have some dust clumps orbiting at very large inclination probably um, on the, on the, um, around the star. Now, um, I will show an example of how a powerful uh, multi wavelength observation can be in understanding these disk structures. So first, when you observe a disk, this is a very famous disk, TW Hydra, um, you observe it at multiple wavelengths. The first thing that you see is that it doesn't look the same. And indeed, uh, with sphere, we trace the small grains um, that are very well coupled to the gas and they're on the surface layers. 
And with ALMA, we trace uh, larger brains in the mid plane. What you can see is that first, the spatial extent is dramatically different. And this is expected. We expect these large grains uh, to drift inwards towards the star. And this is a beautiful example of this uh, size difference. And then you also see that the gap uh, widths and the depths are different. And this is also something that we expect um, from uh, the trapping of this particle. And in that case of TW Hydra, the observations were um, well reproduced with um, super Earths and also with a certain mass planet. So again, a multiple planetary system. And I was saying the special uh, segregation in dust sizes, so uh, the extent, but also, um, um, yeah, the, the, you know, the location of the, sorry, the, yeah, the, the width of the gaps is something that we expect from uh, dust trapping. These are uh, relative transfer uh, models that were uh, generated from hydro simulation followed by dust evolution. So we, we follow the, the coagulation and the fragmentation of dust for uh, two planet uh, masses, one and nine Jupiter mass. And these are the scatterlight prediction and these are the millimeter predictions. So here we have a one Jupiter mass, here a nine Jupiter mass, and you can see that not only this, the images look very different, we have all of these small grains that are located inward of the cavity, but also that uh, basically the location of this ring can, can tell you, can constrain the mass of the planet. So this was um, predictions that were already made uh, before we got a, these observations. And this is something that we see in, I think, all of the disks that we uh, observed until now. Uh, we have, for example, in this uh, case, in this example of LKKS 15, a very famous disk, uh, the inner disk here and one ring that is uh, basically just inward of this bright ring here. We have a second ring uh, that we see in the millimeter. And in that case here, that is uh, actually a um, spectroscopic binary with 4AU, 5AU of separation. Uh, we have the small grains up to the coronographic mask, which is something like uh, 7AU. And uh, with Alma, a beautiful, perfect ring. So out of uh, about 22 um, transition disks that we observed with Sphere and that were, they had data uh, with Alma, we found that uh, basically um, two sort of them, two thirds were uh, consistent with the presence of a planet uh, inward, inside the cavity. So the fact that we have two rings here might actually be that the second ring is also there, but it's shadowed uh, by um, the first ring. And since we are so sensitive to basically the, the surface uh, height and the surface shape, we might not see them, the other rings. The other thing that can happen is that we have um, advent settling in the outer disk. And if you have basically vertical motion of grains going towards the mid plane, then you would also uh, not see them. But the best way to actually uh, constrain the dust let settling is either you look at multiple rings and you see if, um, how different they look, or you look at uh, edge on disks. And these that are very inclined are actually the best way to, to, to probe this. So this is a small survey of very inclined disks. I cannot say edge on because some of them are just very inclined. But you can see in some of them, for example, this is the, the HST observations where you can see the ball, the ball shape of the disk and the small grains that are, that are um, basically um, providing the, the scattered light. And the contours are the, the ALMA observation. Uh, so you can see that it's very striking how flat, how narrow uh, the millimeter emission is compared to the scattered light. So this is direct evidence that small grains are all over the place vertically that are very well coupled to the gas, but that the millimeter pebbles are actually uh, on a very narrow layer settled to the mid plane. These are two examples of uh, disk culture with three different wavelengths with ALMA. And uh, you can see here uh, two examples. So for, this, for the first one here, these are the, the cut along the major axis and these are the cut along the minor axis. There are different colors because there are three different wavelengths and the, that, the dashed line uh, is the, the beam size basically. So for one of the disks, uh, we actually uh, resolve vertical, the vertical, the, sorry, yeah, vertically the, the disk and all of the disks are resolved uh, along the major axis. And what we find is that there is a very sharp, uh, very sharp edges. So the disks are really optically thick up to both uh, sides and that there is very flat uh, emission here. 
So uh, there has not been a detailed model of all of these disks, but what we found is that uh, when you look at different wavelengths, tracing different uh, grain sizes in a way, so here are larger, si larger grains, that the disk looks smaller also in extent. So this is consistent again with uh, grains drifting inward. And they're also more uh, compact vertically. So with more efficient settling. And all of these disks are consistent with, the, with a very, very efficient settling um, uh, in this disk. Now you can use uh, spiral arms to uh, probe the temperature profile of your disk. And what is that is that, for example, this is a disk that has been observed in the infrared, so that's the color, and the contours are in the millimeter. And you can see two, um, that the two spirals do not have the same opening angle at the two different wavelengths. And that is uh, what we expect because, as you, if you remember, this, the spiral opening angle is directly related to the temperature that you're tracing. So if you look at a disk in the millimeter, you trace the, the cold mid plane. If you look in the infrared, you trace the hot surface. So the opening angle is larger in the infrared than in, it is in the millimeter in the mid plane. And that directly tells you about the vertical uh, structuration, the vertical uh, temperature profile. And this is work by Giovanni Rossotti that shows that. Um, if you use a model that has, that has um, isothermal basically prescription vertically, you would, you would have the same opening angle of spirals. Whereas if you look, if you use a disk that is hotter on the surface and colder in the mid plane, you do have different in opening angle. So that's a good way to use um, spiral arms. Uh, but unfortunately, unfortunately, we have uh, many more observations of spiral arms in the infrared than in the millimeter. They are usually very weak and uh, very complex in the millimeter. Now you can use spiral arms also to infer the, to trace uh, gravitational instability. And we only have one case, uh, maybe two cases uh, so far. Uh, these are uh, observation of uh, disk LIS27 at different wavelengths. So you can see that there is um, a disk with actually a gap here. You cannot see it very well. And two spiral arms that we see in the dust. Um, and then if you look at the, the gas, you can see that uh, these are two different tracers. Uh, that the one side of the disk actually looks much more compact than the other side. There's this clear asymmetry uh, between the east and the west. If you look at um, channel maps, we also see that actually, um, so these are the trace of the, the spirals, we actually see that there are clear deviation from Kepler rotation um, in a lot of the channel maps. And these strong deviation are actually co-located with the spirals. So we did some uh, models of gravitational instability and we, we find that we can explain um, uh, qualitatively the, the spirals and, and also the velocity deviation when we consider a uh, disk to star mass ratio of 0 0.3. And this is just uh, the same as uh, showing the difference in, in, uh, in extent, basically the, the height of the surface of along the two um, sides of the disk and we see that one of the, the surf, one of the side of the disk is much uh, basically higher than the other ones. So when you see them projected towards you, they look basically more compact. And this is something that is maybe explained by info, uh, info from the envelope towards the disk. And here is the video that shows, oops, sorry, that shows the, um, the various uh, channel maps where you can see the deviation here from the rotation, but also a bunch of emission that might be due to uh, the, uh, the envelope and that is unfolding, generating gravitational instability, generating the spirals, and maybe generating a planet that is carving a gap. Now we can also trace um, these large scales uh, in a different uh, observations. So these are uh, two observations that I'm going to show in Aciorega and Aburega. Uh, where we see in scatellite a very uh, extended feature. And these are the sphere observation that we get uh, around this region here, where you can see a lot of filaments, uh, spirals, and this dark lane here that we interpret as shadow. So we believe that this tail is actually uh, above the disk and that this tail here is basically the other side of the disk behind the disk. And with ALMA, we also see a very extended um, tail. When you overlay uh, channel maps, you can see that uh, it looks like this tail is actually uh, going away from us, where this tail is going towards us. And this seems to be another, ca another case of info from the envelopes towards the star, uh, possibly creating, leading to a misalignment of the inner disk that will cast this shadow. 
and that is um, I mean in general consistent with simulated uh, observation uh, simulated uh, yeah, observations uh, of info. Now the beautiful case is Aviriga. So these are uh, cron based observations, and these are um, uh, the sphere observation that we got at this scale here. I'm zooming in, and you can see that we have uh, beautiful extended spirals. Um, when we zoom in again, we see again these spirals, and here an over brightness that could be a planetary mass companion. And when you look at the same object with this, at the same scale with Alma, what you see is a beautiful, well behaving ring. So this, all of this um, mess is happening in the gas that we trace here through the small dust that are well coupled. And in the millimeter, it looks like a beautiful, beautiful ring. So maybe the planet that is, maybe there is a companion here, a planet or a star that is carving this cavity, preventing the small, the large grains from uh, uh, drifting in. But at the same time, the small grains do not care. So that's a few examples where we want to connect basically what is happening at large scale and plant formation. And if you remember the first image that I show of S. Uriga and A. Uriga, they were very close to each other. Now, I've been talking about planets all of this time, but where are the planets, right? Um, maybe all of this is due to planets, but uh, so far um, we only know about planets in major systems. So detecting a planet within the bright disk is extremely challenging, and that's the same case as the uh, the lighthouse with the firefly, but even worse. Um, these are the detection limits, for example, for LK calcium 15 that we get with uh, sphere so far. So the, the mass of the planet against the separation uh, to the star from the star. And you can see with different uh, evolutionary models that we need to use to go from contrast or observation to planet masses that we cannot see anything that is fainter, that uh, small, I mean, lighter than. Uh, say eight Jupiter mass. And these are, um, this is a plot that shows a summary for all the sphere observation, all of these, uh, these that have features. And these are the detection limits, so basically the, the, the lower mass that we can get with our observation. And you can see that for basically for all of these, these that are here, we should have been able to, we should have detected planets. And actually there's only one case where we detected planet, which is this one here. So there's still a bit of work in to understand why we haven't found these planets, or maybe we are overestimating the planets that are in these disks. Maybe they're not planets. And another thing that is tricky is that uh, our disks are uh, very highly structured. So for example, this is a case, an example, that is uh, observation of a disk um, with a post-processing that is optimized to look for planets. And the same disk, when you look at it in polarized light, you see that it's highly structured. When you zoom in the inner disk, you see that there is this ring that has all of these blobs. And when you do that, the, post, the usual post-processing to find planets, uh, on this disk image, you actually find a bunch of features and that could look like planets and would lead to um, false detections. And there have been quite a few claims that were not um, confirmed of protoplanets. So we only have one so far, PDS-70b of an embedded planet on planetary system. We actually have two planets there um, that was observed in multiple wavelengths and uh, multiple epochs that is bound to the star. So we have a protoplanets here for sure, located at about 20 AU and quite massive up to 15 Jupiter mass. And there has been a subsequent uh, detection of a second planet in the same system that is actually here, but it's really difficult to see it here because in the infrareds, even if with 40 meter second resolution, we cannot separate it from the, the outer disk. So here we have PDS-70b, here PDS-70c. We know it's there because it has been detected with H-alpha. So both uh, planets emit in H-alpha, which means that they're still accreting gas uh, from their disk. They're still being formed. And the spectrum of these planets actually suggests that there is presence of dust around it, either in the cloud of the planet or in the circumplanetary disk um, satellite forming this. And what we did on this object is a bunch of uh, studies, and this is the work of uh, Jehan Bay. Um, here you have the sea observation, the continuum observation in, of this disk in the, in the millimeter where you see this beautiful ring. And uh, Jehan reproduced the observation by uh, considering two planets uh, that are uh, close to uh, two to one resonance. And uh, also in hydrodynamic simulation, he looked at the dynamics of those grains and so that uh, basically the large grains are well trapped in one ring 
producing this uh, very similar continuum uh, emission. And that only the small grains can flow in and field uh, an inner disk. And this configuration is very similar to our own SOA system with Jupiter and Saturn. Um, and it's very interesting to think that maybe in the inner disk you would want to work to form um, Earth's nice planet. Um, these are our observations, a little bit uh, uh, focus on uh, the latest results. Um, so here you can see the beautiful continuum ring uh, with the location of the two planets. There is an inner disk here that you cannot see very well in this uh, uh, figure. And these are the CO uh, observations uh, with the two planets. You can see that uh, there is a really uh, strongly depleted gap also in the gas. Here it is the, that's uh, the continuum absorption. And we have a marginal um, observation of a spur or a bridge from the outer disk to the inner disk. We also looked uh, more carefully in the, uh, in, inside the cavity and find that there is uh, evidence for dust located close to the planets, which could be circumplanetary disk. And when you convert the flux of this um, emission, the flux of uh, this uh, image, into uh, the dust mass of the circumplanetary disk, you need to consider different assumptions for the temperature. We find that the, the dust mass is actually very, very low, uh, a few uh, 10 to minus three Earth masses. Now you can look with the VLTI, and that's my only slide on VLTI, um, when you combine the, 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 the light from these four telescopes, so like a mini ALMA with only six baseline, you get an angular resolution of 1.5 New York second. And we try to actually resolve uh, the CPD, the circumplanetary disk around uh, B and C. And we found that with this angular resolution in the infrared, they are, the observations are consistent with not being resolved. So we can put a constraint on how extended the circumplanetary disk should look in the infrared, which is actually tiny. That's my final slide. We have more observations now on these objects uh, that we are tracking with ALMA and the three papers in preparation. So we, with higher angular resolution, we are able to actually separate uh, the, the dust emission very close to C from the outer disk. And this looks like a non-resolved um, uh, emission. So probably a circumplanetary disk. On the other hand, around B, the other object, uh, we have um, some faint diffuse emission that we see only when we actually uh, lower the angular resolution. And that's not all. It's, we found that uh, with high angular resolution observation that this uh, ring here is actually constituted of two rings that we do not, uh, we only marginally resolve. And that might mean that there is another planet located here that we haven't found so far. And that the same goes for the inner disk. It's also very marginal, but it seems that the inner disk has some structure as well. We see observation at high spectral resolution, we are going uh, to be able to look for kinematical signature and we can also reconstruct uh, the shape of the 3D of the surface and the work of Miriam Keter and Richard Teague. But you can see that the surface is very flat in the cavity and then rises up. And then Stefano Fakin is working on the chemistry program where he has uh, 16 lines detected um, in uh, PDS-70. So my conclusion, my conclusion is that um, at least in scattered light, uh, all this seems to show features when you observe with high angular resolution, all infrared bright disks. And we still have a lot of work to do on the ones that are very faint to see if they do not have substructures or it's just a matter of angular resolution. You can use rings to infer um, the processes of dust dynamics, dust trapping and dust growth. You can also use rings to measure the shape of the surface. And that has, when you compare it to other traces like CO, a strong implication for um, mixing and settling of dust grains and then the earliest stage of planet formation. Then you can use all of these features to reproduce, to infer the presence of planets and their mass and their properties, of course, uh, assuming a couple of assumptions in your models. Um, and that's, for example, the uh, work from Jehan Bey. Uh, these are the planet masses that are, they were inferred from uh, surveys in the sub millimeter. So you could do the same with scattered light, but this is highly model dependent. And I want to stress that there are other scenarios that can reproduce rings, uh, other mechanisms, and also that the thermodynamics that is uh, considered in the model strongly affect the dust structure. And that um, has been shown in one paper by uh, Fakini and Bay this year. 
You can use spirals to infer uh, the vertical temperature profile of your disk and uh, infer the companion location and also the presence of info. In general, if you see anything that is bright in scattered line, it means that you have a substructure. So you have uh, some processes that is affecting the scale height, the height uh, of your disk. Shadows can be used uh, to constrain the inner disk structures, if you, even if you cannot resolve the inner disk and um, tells you that the inner disk is highly dynamic as well. I mean, we're looking at uh, features that are quite far compared to the planet population that we know uh, is um, in the exoplanetary uh, systems. Uh, I strongly advocate for multi wavelength approach because I believe, strongly believe that it's key uh, to constrain the disk structure and to constrain the dust dynamics. And of course, there are very exciting uh, prospects because from the ground, we're going to have uh, better telescopes very soon. And we have JWST, uh, that will really allow to search for embedded planets uh, in disks, and of course ALMA uh, through the, the kinematics. Thank you. Thanks very much, Marian. That was there. Um, we have questions. We have one question in the Q and A. Okay. You want me to read that? <laughs> sure. Okay. So. Um, the question is, do the, do the misalignments that you're talking about with, I assume this is related to the sort of broken disk geometries, do those always happen in, in binary or multiple systems? Um, <clears throat> I don't think it always happens. For example, we have um, circumbinary disks that do not show shadows. Um, but we also have <laughs> these gigantic disks uh, with multiple spirals and indeed they often have uh, shadows. So um, one thing that we would want to do is to observe a lot of circumbinary disks and check for the occurrence rate of these uh, shadows to see if this can be related, for example, to the spin orbit misalignment in planets. Um, but um, so far we have very low statistics. Right. Um, well, let me let me ask you a couple of questions myself. So I was curious. Um, I'm curious about PDS seventy. <clears throat> it was really interesting to see the gravity measurements. I, I wonder what are the prospects for um, you know a dynamical constraint on the orbit and ultimately the mass from astrometry. Um, is that? Uh, I mean, I would imagine something at twenty AU. That's I, I didn't do the math. That's a few Jupiter masses would move several degrees per year in an arc. Um, is, is that something that's plausible or, or too hard? Yeah, so in, actually in this paper that of Jason Wong that uh, is submitted, uh, they, they do also an analysis of the, basically the assuming it's a stable uh, system of the ast astrometry. And actually with uh, VLTI, we can get to an astrometric accuracy of few micro arc seconds. So it's very, very accurate. And um, so far with the measurement that we have, uh, there's only, I think the mass of B that can be constrained to be lower than 10 Jupiter mass basically. And, but there, there's no constraint on C. Yeah. But in five years or yeah. 10 years. Yes, exactly. I mean, this is, not, is an object that will keep being monitored. So, oh, that's really interesting. Do you, I think do it was you... just discovered two two years ago. So, yeah, right. Uh... <laughs> I'm, I'll be patient. Um, I I also was wondering about the um, the shadows. I, I guess I hadn't personally appreciated the time scales at which the shadows change so much. Um, is there any is there any effort to do intranight measurements um, where you could actually, I mean, it looked like they sort of jump around from night to night. Can you actually see smooth motions or are they not smooth? So um, on that disk in particular, they're not, they are not smooth. Let me just go back to the plot. So based on that one, we had only asked um, a few observations, but they keep, they were not classified as good enough, so they kept reobserving and reobserving. So in the end, we had a bunch, a bunch of them. And um, indeed, for example, uh, sometimes you see that they're, they're more or less always located at the same uh, position angle. I mean, within 30 degrees, maybe. But sometimes it's like the, the shadow breaks in two. Or, um, so this really hints 
at the fact that it's not just a smooth inclined disc, that is something that is very clumpy. Um, it still has to be optically thick radially to be able to cast the shadow. Um, but clearly it still allows some light to go through. Um, so um, to go back to your question, whether we, we have we are able to observe it through one night. I think we have never, I mean, there's not been any, as far as I know, any program to do that. I think it would be very interesting to do that, but at the same time to monitor the star, for example, right. because this uh, is probably due to the, um, I mean, this star has a, a, a strong magnetic field. So it's, there must be some misaligned magnetic field. So there must be something that is connected to what is really occurring very, very close to the star. Um, it's interesting because the near-field excess is variable, and so at some point it goes really to zero, so it's like there is no more inner disk. Um, so something really like a, you know, very, um, how to say, dynamical debris disk is present in this inner region. Okay, I see Charles has his hand up. Go ahead. Okay, so can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, so thank you for a very interesting talk. I have a question actually specifically about the settling of dust. Can you distinguish really between settling, which I take to be the mo movement of large grains towards the, the midplane, from selective growth of grains in uh, colder, denser re regions? Mm. No, observationally, I don't think we can constrain um, growth versus um, settling. What mm -hmm. makes us think that this settling is because we are also looking at the small dust, basically. So we see that the small dust is all over the place and we don't have these large grains very high up. Now, um, why do we have this very flat uh, disk if it's you know, one of the two or both at the same time? I expect it's both at the same time because we need to grow this grain to 20 moles at some point. Okay, thank you. 